Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here with my wife, uh, Ling. I was just thinking uh, years ago when I was a local councillor in the area of East London that I now represent as MP, somebody rang me up and started talking to me about a problem of rubbish she had in her back garden. And she talked about this for a while. And, and I said, um, so where, where do you live? And it turned out she lived nowhere near the area that I was the councillor for. She was the other side of the the borough, and I, I said, well, so why have you rung me about this? And she said, well, you're always in the local paper talking about a lot of rubbish. I thought you were the <laughs> ideal person to ask. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll try and do a little bit better um, t tonight. But I, I really, I want to begin by thanking the Jubilee Centre for its work and its witness over the past 30 years for the, the commitment that it's expressed to Christian social reform and for offering consistently a biblical perspective on issues and trends. I applaud the Centre's conviction, conviction that I share, that the Bible presents a coherent and compelling vision for society that's got enduring relevance for Britain and the world in this century. And at the heart of it, it's concern for uh, right relationships. And many of us are very very grateful for the commitment of Michael Schluter and of those who've shared in this work over the past 30 years and of the consistency with which that vision has been applied to many different fields in that time. A lot's been uh, achieved, not least uh, in uh, averting the downgrading of Sunday to um, a day like um, every other. I've watched successive attempts in the House of Commons to bring that change about and I've seen them all rebuffed, uh, thanks to the resilient coalition between the churches on the one hand and the shop workers union Usdor on the other. And it is thanks to Michael and to the ideas which underpin this centre that that coalition remains in place and continues to be politically effective uh, today. And there are going to be some more efforts, I have no doubt, which will have to be rebuffed um, as well. Um, a lot of people say you ought not to mix faith and politics, and if you do, you're asking for trouble. And they point to trouble somewhere in the world and say, there you are, that's what inevitably happens. So I'm grateful to the Jubilee Centre for taking a different view. And I want to set out really the opposite uh, view this evening, that faith is in fact a great starting point for politics because faith is the source of exactly the motivations and the values that we need to make politics work. I, I think what this is really about is hope. Hope is at the heart of our faith and it needs to be at the heart of politics as well. The hope in the Bible isn't a, a wishy-washy kind of hope, a hope that things are going to be better someday, somewhere beyond the blue. Instead, it's a down-to-earth, roll-up-your-sleeves, work-hard kind of, of hope. Tom Wright, the former Bishop of Durham, puts it like this, people who believe in the resurrection, in God making a whole new world in which everything will be set right at last, are unstoppably motivated to work for that new world in the present. We've seen over the past few years what I think is a, a quite remarkable example of people in churches being unstoppably motivated to work for that new world in the present. I think we could point to quite a number of them, but I'm thinking of the rise of the Trussell Trust and of the, the food banks. The first of them started in Salisbury uh, over a decade ago when church members who were setting up a charity aiming at um, tackling uh, hardship overseas became aware of real hardship on their doorstep. In the uh, year before the general election, uh, there were uh, 30,000 people in 30,000 households had to visit a food bank because at some point in the year they didn't have enough money to buy food for themselves and their families. The Prime Minister is quite right uh, to claim, as he always does when he's asked uh, about this, in fact, uh, this is the only thing he ever says about food banks, uh, that demand for them went up tenfold under Labour. That's quite true. In fact, you could say demand went up 10,000-fold because it went from zero up to 30,000 under the Labour government, and that is uh, unquestionably uh, the case. In the three years since the general election, it's risen tenfold again from around about 30,000 households 
uh, in the year before the general election to well over 300,000 in the last year. Food banks are uh, reporting that this year already demand has doubled and trebled as the impact of the government's benefit cuts uh, have hit. Three new food banks open every week. And if it wasn't for them, and the Trussell Trust food banks, which account for the great uh, majority, are all, every single one of them, is based on a church, we could by now, and perhaps I'm pretty sure we would by now, have a serious problem of malnourishment around the, uh, the country. So don't let anybody say that churches don't make much difference uh, anymore. And I wonder if we had speculated a few years ago about what would happen in secular 21st century Britain if large numbers of people were suddenly unable to afford to buy enough food, whether we would have guessed that it would be the churches that would have stepped up to fill that gap. That is what has happened. And looking back on it, in reality, in modern secular Britain, who else could have done it apart from uh, the churches? When the, this government was elected, Ian Duncan Smith made a point of uh, permitting job centres to refer people to food banks. A ban having apparently been in place previously for a while in the previous government. I was a minister responsible for job centres. I wasn't aware that we'd banned uh, job centres referring people to food banks, but apparently uh, we had. Ian Duncan Smith lifted that ban, uh, quite right uh, too. But in a, a written answer last week uh, in the House of Commons, I was told that policy has now been uh, reversed. Job centres uh, do not now, it, it says, issue vouchers for food banks. And the reason is that ministers uh, are facing some very difficult questions about the impact of their policies on poor people in Britain. And if you listen to the ministers, uh, and I'll quote, well, uh, Lord Freud, the welfare reform minister, um, he, he says that the growth in food bank demand um, is not linked to problems in the benefit system. Uh, he says uh, instead, and I, I quote, by definition, he says, there is an almost infinite demand for a free good, which is why everyone's turning up for food banks, because there's some free food uh, available. Uh, Michael Gove, the education secretary, says that people turning up at food banks are mismanaging their finances. But volunteers in those churches meeting week after week, people who through absolutely no fault of their own are not able to afford food for themselves and their families, those volunteers are seeing what is really uh, happening and seeing what the ministers are saying on that subject is uh, not uh, the case. At the Labour Party conference in Brighton uh, a week on Sunday, we're going to be launching the report of a project that I've been working on with the think tank Demos over the past uh, two and a half years. It's called Faith, Community and Society, and it's about the role of religious faith in modern Britain. <clears throat> of course, some people take the view that faith should not have a public uh, role. It should be a private matter only. That view, I think, is now, thankfully, in retreat, not least because of the growing presence in Britain of religious minorities for whom their faith is a very public matter indeed. Demos, uh, the think tank, has published already two of the three parts of our study uh, called Faithful Citizens and Faithful Providers. Faithful Citizens drew on the European Values Survey to analyze the characteristics of people of faith it showed that unlike in the USA, people of faith are actually more likely to say they are on the left politically than on the uh, right, a fact that's of great interest to people like me. Um, according to the European Value Survey uh, as well, about one in eight people in Britain belong to a religious organisation. And they're far, far more likely to be volunteers in all kinds of ways than people who do not belong to a religious organization. In fact, um, for several of the categories of volunteering identified in the European Values Survey, volunteering on women's issues, uh, on development and human rights, uh, on local community action, also volunteering to help with the trade union, the number of volunteers accounted for by the one in eight who belong to a religious organization exceeds the number accounted for by the seven in eight who don't. Faithful providers 
uh, looked at a, a set of organizations which are faith-based and provide public services. And it concludes uh, that the faith basis of those organizations provides a very good foundation for a modern public service ethos, something which, something which is frankly a bit under strain at the moment. They conclude there is no evidence in the organizations surveyed of any bias in favor of adherence to the faith and no evidence either uh, of aggressive proselytizing. And very often, too often, I believe, public authorities are reluctant to commission services from faith-based organizations because of concerns along those lines. Demos, which has absolutely no brief for faith at all, has concluded from its research that those concerns are unfounded. The third part of the, the study, which we will be publishing for the first time on Sunday week, is to look at what all this means for politics. Trust in politics is at a pretty low ebb. It needs to be rebuilt. And I'm convinced that engaging people in it whose starting point is faith is essential if we are to have a chance of uh, succeeding. Um, <coughs> I want to suggest that the, the, the renewal of trust in politics requires a new influx of values into politics which are at the moment in short supply and that arguably the most fruitful source for them in modern Britain is in uh, the churches. And I've got a list of, of six, responsibility, solidarity, persistence and patience, compassion, tolerance, and truthfulness. And I just want to say a couple of words uh, about each of them. Responsibility, recognizing that a better future can only emerge when people take ownership of improving their own lives and the lives of the community uh, around them. It isn't about waiting for somebody else to sort out uh, the problem. And I think the evidence is pretty clear that people in churches are prepared to acknowledge responsibility and to act. And food banks are a great example of that having happened. We need more responsibility in our politics. Solidarity. People in churches belong to a worshipping community. They don't have the, the sense of isolation, which is so common in wider society. We recognize in churches our dependence on others and their dependence on us. And that sense of solidarity is crucial for effective politics. It's also, by the way, the essence of the labor movement. Beatrice Webb, the founder with her husband Sidney of the Fabian movement was a deeply secular woman but she remarked from her observations in the town of Backup in Lancashire how the chapel prepared the community for democracy and self-government and that phenomenon is just as evident uh, in churches today. Effective political activism demands strong ties between the people involved and churches are among the very few places where that solidarity uh, is today being built. Third, politics requires patience and persistence, a willingness to plug away even when the prospects don't seem too bright and perhaps when carrying on uh, strikes onlookers as foolish. A willingness to persist requires hope. And frankly, hope in God is much more sustainable than hope merely in politics. Expecting too much from politics is often the quickest route to disillusion. Believers can recognize and accept uh, what politics is not capable of achieving as well as what it is. And that's very uh, important. Fourth, politics, which is worth supporting, needs to be grounded in compassion. It was above all the moral imagination and energy of the churches which inspired the Jubilee 2000 campaign at the end of the 20th century for the cancellation of the debt sowed by the poorest countries to the richest and in the Make Poverty History campaign which culminated in the G8 summit in Glen Eagles in 2005. Those campaigns uh, provided the basis for the last government's renewal of Britain's overseas aid policy and for signing up to the commitment in line with the United Nations target that our international development budget should be at least 0.7% of our gross domestic product. And because it came from the churches, not from some more sectarian source, 
That aim, that goal, survived the change of government and is now robustly defended by the Prime Minister from criticism from uh, some uh, of his, uh, his backbenchers. The churches did that. It wouldn't have happened uh, otherwise. Compassion means to suffer alongside and to be authentic. It does require actively sharing with people facing hardship. Churches are very unusual today in bringing people together, completely equal before God, across huge divides of class and uh, of income. Fifth, tolerance. Politics needs tolerance. A lot of people, of course, link faith to intolerance rather than to tolerance. But actually, tolerance is in part a Christian gift to society. Locke's, uh, the philosopher uh, Locke's concept of things indifferent is derived largely from uh, St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and to the conviction that some matters, like uh, not eating meat sacrificed to idols, were not essential uh, to faith. Believers understand the difference between uh, sin on the one hand and crime on the other. There are very strong theological grounds for allowing space for and freely cooperating with people of different uh, religious convictions and theological persuasions. And last, politics needs a commitment to truthfulness. Recognition of accountability is inherent in faith. People who believe in God have a better reason than anyone else to tell the truth. There is, that's such an important, uh, that is so important for trust in politics, trust at a low ebb. We need new commitments to truthfulness if we're going to rebuild trust. Where is that commitment going to come from? The theologian Stanley Hauerwas, speaking in Parliament a couple of years ago, was asked by somebody who was there what practical piece of advice he would offer to somebody working in politics. His simple but rather disarming answer was they should tell the truth. Responsibility, solidarity, patience, persistence, tolerance, truthfulness. That's my uh, list. Let me know if you think uh, I've missed something out. It seems to me those are the resources, the crucially important values, which the work of the Jubilee Centre has been building for the past 30 years. We can't do without uh, those things. The old stock of them is being eroded and worn down. The prospect of soldiering on without them or with very little of them is deeply troubling. We need them urgently to be renewed and rebuilt and there aren't many institutions where we can see that rebuilding taking place. But the Jubilee Centre is one of them and I, uh, what I want uh, to see is its work continuing, because I think its work is going to be at least as important, as Chris was just saying, in the next 30 years as it has been in the past. So I, too, want to wish everybody involved a very, very productive future. Thank you.